So we're going to pick up tonight. We're in Isaiah 54. Um, something to keep in mind when we're dealing with prophecy is that you know Isaiah lived 700 years before the birth of Christ, right? And so, and then another. It's been another 2,000 plus years since then. Uh, if you're looking forward at some mountaintops, you cannot see the valleys in between, right? And so Isaiah, looking forward, could see certain mountaintop events. And it's hard to gauge which mountain is in front of which one, um, you know, what, what events are, how far apart the mountains are. We just know there are peaks, right? He could see... Um, he could see the, the mountain that, he, that Jesus is crucified on. He could see that Jesus uh, is victorious, that he's coming back, all that stuff. But the time in between and all the details were pretty hard to see from that far back. And so sometimes it's hard to tell because remember there were some practical things, uh, short-term uh, things that came to pass that he prophesied and, and the people saw it happen. So sometimes it's hard to tell, is he talking about something that's going to happen in the short term, or is it a long-term thing? Some of his prophecies are dual fulfillment, so it's both. Uh, so it gets a little confusing. So over the last five, six chapters, we've, we've been seeing uh, Isaiah has mostly been talking about how the people of, uh, of Judah are going to be taken captive by the Babylonians, and then... Uh, they're going to live in captivity for about 70 years, but God is going to bring them back. And he let, he let them know, here's what led to it. You know, you kind of brought this on yourself with your idolatry and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but I'm, I'm not forsaking you forever. I'm going to bring you back. So there's some of that. Um, but also, uh, you know, at the same time, he's been talking about when Jesus sets up his kingdom and all that. So last week we were in chapter 53, which is like the pinnacle when it comes to uh, prophecy about Jesus, right? That's where uh, we, we learned about the, the suffering servant, right? That this servant that God was going to send, uh, he was going to be rejected and, and uh, you know, a man of grief, acquainted with sorrows, and, or a man of sorrows acquainted with grief, uh, that they were going to beat him and... Uh, murder him, all that stuff. Uh, so I'm, I'm bringing all that up because there's a reason chapter 54 happens to be after chapter 53, right? <laughs> yeah, there's, there, there's a reason it's where it's at. Uh, we'll, we'll get into all that here in a minute, but let's pray and then we'll, we'll see if we can understand it. God, we thank you this evening for giving us the chance to just be together, uh, uh, Lord, and that uh, we can we can open your word and see your will for our lives. It's not always clear, uh, Lord, so we just pray that you would uh, help us to understand tonight. Uh, and what we, what we get right, help us to apply it and, and grow closer to you because of it. Whatever we get wrong, we just pray you wipe that from our minds and, and replace it with the zeal to come back again and find the truth. Lord, we pray for your blessing on the message and on your people. In Jesus' name, amen. So, like I said, this, this is right after him describing the coming, you know, the, the coming of Jesus, his crucifixion, all of that. Uh, you know, this perfect servant, he's going to come and suffer, be lifted up. Um, eventually, all the world will bow to him, all of that stuff. So then we get into 54, verse 1. He says, shout for joy, or your translation may say sing, right? Uh, he says, shout for joy, O barren one. You who have borne no child, break forth into joyful shouting and cry aloud, you who have not travailed. For the sons of the desolate one will be more numerous than the sons of the married woman, says the Lord. So, right off the bat, just to be clear, all the, you know, the big brainiac people, all the theologians, they all argue about what this verse means, and I can, I can see why. It's a little bit confusing. But he, it's, we'll just look at the obvious stuff first, right? He's, he says, hey, you, who, uh, you lady who wants to have a baby and you haven't, right? Uh, sing for, shout for joy. 
Now, some of you are like, yeah, I have, I've had a bunch of kids. You should shout for joy. You don't have any. You know, but that's not, that's not what he means, right? He, he's, he's kind of turning things on its head because that would be a terrible thing to say to someone who's really trying to have kids and can't, right? That you should just be thankful you don't. Um, in, in the ancient world, uh, you know, a woman who was unable to have children, that was like a disgrace, right? It was a, a, it was a, a thing that uh, you didn't want, and obviously it's going gonna, it's gonna to impact your family negatively because your kids helped, you know, work your farm and all that kind of stuff. But he says, basically, look, you who are dissatisfied... Rejoice because you will be satisfied, right? That's what, how God's economy works, right? The, the morning will be comforted, the first will be last, and the last will be first, you know. Um, but he's using some specific imagery, right? He says, uh, he, he talks about him, uh, a married woman, and, and uh, you know, one having a baby, one not. We talked about this a few weeks ago, that in Jeremiah, it tells us that God the Father was married to who? Do you remember? Israel, right? Israel was the bride of of God the Father. Jesus is betrothed to the church, right? He's, uh, the church is the bride of Christ, the Bible tells us, but the marriage supper hasn't happened, right? He says, I'm going to go to prepare a place for you, right? Which is what a, a groom's, the groom would do, right? Back in those days, the, the groom would build a house on his father's property. And once the house was ready, then he would come for his bride and, you know, uh, the bride would make herself ready and they'd have a big celebration. Um, so there's... There's like two different brides. There's two different women in this verse. And one has a baby and one doesn't. It's really confusing stuff. Luckily, um, the Apostle Paul, uh, we've talked about this a lot in our study of Isaiah, that Paul is the New Testament Isaiah, basically, right? And Isaiah is the Old Testament Paul. And so uh, Paul, you know, likes to expound on things that Isaiah introduced. So Paul talks about this same verse uh, and and helps shed a little bit of light on it. But it is Paul, so he, uh, he's not always the, uh, the simplest. Uh, get, he doesn't always give the simplest explanation. So we're going to take a look at it in Galatians 4, verse 21. He says, Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondwoman, the other by a free woman, right? That's some of the imagery we're seeing in, back in Isaiah. So he's talking about Sarah and Hagar, right? I don't know if you know that story or not, but Abraham, God told him, you're going to have a son. I'm going to bless you all these ways through that son. And Abraham and Sarah weren't willing to be patient and wait. And so Sarah cook, cook, cooked up a plan. Hey, here's my handmaiden go in the tent and make a baby with her, and then we'll raise it, and that's how we'll have a son. And uh, Abraham was like, are you sure, honey? You know, I don't know how much of an argument he put up, but he, he went along with it, and uh, it turned out badly. Uh, verse 23, it says, But he who was of the bondwoman, Hagar, the servant, uh, was born according to the flesh, and he of the free woman Through promise. So this is Ishmael and Isaac. Those two are basically the fathers of two, uh, not races, I guess, but, uh, you know, basically the Jews and what would eventually become the Arab and Islamic world, right? So they're still, you know, butting heads today. Uh, Verse 24, he says, uh, which things are symbolic? For these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar. Uh, For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. That's super confusing, but that's not what we're after tonight. Verse 26, it says, but the Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all. So Paul says, look, 
Yes, there were two different branches of people that came from Abraham. Um, but we are, you know, all believers are children of Abraham, right? you know, no matter what your uh, ethnic background is, right? Verse 27, he says, For it is written, Rejoice, O barren, you who do not bear. Break forth and shout, you who are not in labor. For the desolate has many more children than she who has a husband. So he's quoting that verse from Isaiah. Verse 28, Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. And remember, Paul wrote this letter, uh, Galatians, he wrote it to, um, not to Jewish people, these were Gentile people. And he says, we are all children of the promise, right? Uh, but as he who was born according to the flesh then persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what does the Scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of free. That's all wordy stuff. But look, he, he says, we're not under the law, we're, but we're children of the promise, just like Isaac. Right? No matter what the circumstances were that led to you to where you are now, if you believe in Jesus, you are just as much a child of the promise as Isaac was. And the Jews didn't see it that way, right? They, they were like, no, you have to be born Jewish with this blood. Uh, so Paul, he lets us know that he says this verse in Isaiah is relating to you guys, right? To Gentiles, to the church. And I think it's a little bit of both. And the tribulation and the, the last days, uh, we're told that there's going to be 144,000 Jewish people who uh, become evangelists for Jesus. And they're going to help lead Gentiles to the Lord and bring them to faith. And more souls were born again and added to you know, the roles of heaven after the death of Christ than when Jesus was here on earth. Because Israel had become desolate and barren, right? They were dry. They weren't ready uh, for, you know, they weren't ready to bring forth fruit when Jesus was here. Um, and so Isaiah, he's looking forward to a time in the future where there's going to be this huge restoration where more people are going to be added to uh, you know, God's family than they can possibly imagine. Now, in the short term, remember we talked about this last week, that the, when they come out of Babylon, only about 50,000 of them actually come out and come back to Israel. Uh, so there was concern, like, you know, there's so, we're so few, uh, how are we even going to be able to you know, maintain our borders with such a small population? And God blessed them and grew them. So part of it, Isaiah, I think, is letting them know, no, it's, it's going to be okay. But long term, he's letting them know there's going to be way more people in your family than you realize. So I think verse 1, he's kind of giving us a little picture of the church. Verse 2, we'll go back to Isaiah 54, verse 2. He, now he's definitely going to be talking about Israel because he says this. He says, enlarge the place of your tent. Stretch out the curtains of your dwellings, spare not, lengthen your cords, and strengthen your pegs. Right, so tents were just made up of layers of cloth, and making a tent larger was just a matter of, you know, opening a wall and, and adding more material, right? And he says, this barren woman, because that's the condition Israel is in, uh, is, he's telling her to, I want you to, Add a wing, add a nursery, add a wing to your house, right? Uh, expand your tent, even though you're not pregnant right now. I want you to prepare as if you are. Uh, you know, start making room now for all the kids that are going to be coming your way, all the blessings that are coming your way. You know, you may, you may be feeling a little uh, stretched thin right now, um, and it could be that maybe God's calling you to enlarge your tent, you know, to make more room for him, 
make room for what he wants to do next. I've found for me personally those times when I'm just uneasy and can't be, you know, I'm not settled or, um, you know, just everything's a little bit off. Uh, very often it's uh, God's, you know, subtly trying to get my attention for something he's about to do. I was talking with uh, some folks earlier. Sunday, uh, we had all kinds of crazy mishaps and things that, you know, we were struggling with around the building and during services and stuff. And we were like, man, it's like we have gremlins, you know. And then we got a message later from Eric, who, you know, uh, stands at our connect table, and he lets us know, hey, three people got saved Sunday. And, and I was like, okay, well, that makes total sense why everything was, you know, a little, it wasn't, everything didn't run smooth uh, because God was like, hey, I, you need to be preparing for what's next, right? Make, it, make a little room. Uh, you know, live like it's not an abstract thing uh, on the horizon, but that it's a fact that's going to happen, right? Uh, that God's going to move, God's going to bless, or, you know, God's, God's got some plan for me, and I'm going to work as if I know what it is, and in, in the meantime, hopefully, he'll, he'll let me know what it is, you know? Because one thing God loves to do is to fill the empty, right? To, when we make room for him, he loves to fill it. Verse 3, he says, For you will spread abroad to the right and to the left, and your descendants will possess nations and will resettle the desolate cities. So he said, he's telling Israel, look, you feel like uh, you're stretched thin right now, but someday there's going to be so many of you, you're going to spread across the whole world. When Israel is restored, her husband, God, uh, says she's going to have more sons than she can number. Because they're going to inherit the Gentiles, right? The church is going to be, we're all one big family, basically. I know this can be confusing stuff, but Revelation 19 tells us that the church comes back with Jesus, right? When Jesus comes back, so does, so does the church. And Matthew 25 tells us that Jesus sets up his kingdom and he's going to reign for a thousand years. Uh, Ezekiel tells us that uh, David will, will be on earth with him. He's going to be the prince of Israel or prince of Jerusalem, I think they call him. So David's going to rule Israel while Jesus rules the world. Uh, and uh, another prophet describes how the you know, people will come from all over the world for the Feast of Tabernacles where they're, they're going to come to Jerusalem to worship him. So... In Isaiah's time, they're worried there's, there's not even enough of us to you know, keep the lawns mowed, right? And he says, someday, everybody from the whole world is going to want to come to Jerusalem to worship the king. So make room, right? Get ready. And now the husband, father, says to his wife, verse 4, he says, fear not. For you will not be put to shame. And do not feel humiliated, for you will not be disgraced, but you will forget the shame of your youth and the reproach of your widowhood you will remember no more. You know, if nothing else, God is a God of, of restoration. He, he loves to remove shame and heartache, the things that we tend to hold on to the hardest. For whatever reason, we just want to carry that stuff around. And he says, that, that's not what I have for you, what I want for you. Verse 5, he says, For your husband is your maker, whose name is the Lord of hosts, and your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel, who is called the God of all the earth. He says, let me remind you, right? You're in this covenant relationship, not with just someone who might let you down. You're in, in this covenant relationship with the maker of all things, right? Verse 6, for the Lord has called you like a wife forsaken and grieved in spirit, even like a wife of one's youth when she is rejected, says your God. For a brief moment, I forsook you, but with great compassion, I will gather you. In an outburst of anger, I hid my face from you for a moment. 
but with everlasting loving kindness, I will have compassion on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. He says, look, yes, we were separated for a while. You turned your back on me, and you walked away from me. And if you do that, I will let you. Uh, you know, you, you turned your back on me, and you ended up in Babylon. I sent my son, I sent my servant, and you crucified him. But still, I never gave up on you. Right? This is what he's saying to Israel. Yeah, I never gave up on you. Verse 9, for this is like the days of Noah to me. When I swore that the waters of Noah would not flood the earth again, so I have sworn that I will not be angry with you, nor will I rebuke you. For the mountains may, may be removed and the hills may shake, but my loving kindness will not be removed from you, and my covenant of peace will not be shaken, says the Lord who has compassion on you. So he says, just as I gave Noah the sign of the rainbow that I would never again destroy the, the earth with a, uh, with a flood, he says, after I restore you, Israel, uh, We'll never be apart again. I'll never, he, he'll never stop loving his people. Now, very often when people study this chapter, they look for how are the way, you know, what are the ways that this was fulfilled. Um, I, they're looking for something that they can't find because it hasn't happened yet, right? There's still been times where Israel has. Israel has still not returned to their Lord. Uh, verse 11, he says, O oh, afflicted one, storm-tossed and not comforted, behold, I will set your stones in antimony, or colorful gems, and your foundations I will lay in sapphires. Moreover, I will make your battlements of rubies and your gates of crystal and your entire wall of precious stones. So he says, I, what I'm building for you, when we're going to be together, I'm going to build it out of all these you know, precious materials that he describes. That is not what Israel looks like right now. Now, Israel is a beautiful place. It's much, much, we've uh, looked at some pictures during this uh, series of Israel. You know, the, most of us have this picture of you know, it's all brown and deserts and a big rock. And, you know, and the fact of the matter is it's one of the most beautiful places on earth. It's a like a Mediterranean climate, it's amazing. Uh, but it's still not what is described here. Now, maybe he's just being figurative, but you know, Ezra describes how the older, um, the older folks, when they come back into, the, into Israel and they see the, the new, the rebuilt temple, when they looked at it, they wept because they could remember how much better, how much more beautiful the original temple was. Uh, and so, yeah, Israel is beautiful today, but it's not what he describes here. John has a vision in Revelation of what the new Jerusalem will look like. Not this, you know, not like uh, the remodeled neighborhood. He's talking about like the heavenly city, right? When everything's done after the kingdom and all that stuff, the Bible tells us there's a new heaven, a new earth uh, where we dwell with him. This is what he describes in Revelation 21, verse 19. Actually, we'll, we'll start in verse 10. He says, So he took me in the Spirit to a great high mountain, and he showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. And it shone with the glory of God and sparkled like a precious stone, like jasper as clear as crystal. Then verse 19, The wall of the city was built on foundation stones inlaid with twelve precious stones. The first was jasper, the second sapphire, the third a gate, the fourth emerald. And he goes on, just describing how amazing it is. He's describing the same stuff Isaiah is describing. And so there's, he's, Isaiah is basically saying, look, there's coming a day. Not just when the captives come back from Babylon. Not when the nation was restored back in 1940, was it 48? Uh, not even in the millennial kingdom when, when earth is restored to like an Eden-like state. There's coming a day when 
uh, the new Jerusalem, the heavenly city, is where we're going to be. And so that's what, it, when, I, when we started the message, I was talking about how Isaiah is looking so far in the future, it's hard to tell what event happens before what. You know, he's described several future events that are future, but some of them are happen later than others. And he says, look, it seems, it may seem desolate right now. But look at what I'm going to build. Right? You, you may be in a really barren, dry time right now. But look at what I have coming for you. Isaiah 54, verse 13, he says, All your sons will be taught of the Lord, and the well-being of your sons will be great, or, or shalom, he says, great peace. That's definitely not how it's happening right now, right? I mean, we, I'm sure you've, you've seen some of the drama about what's being taught in schools and stuff, you know, but this is not dis, uh, describing the present day for sure. He says, one day, Israel, all of your sons will be taught of the Lord. As a matter of fact, they're going to learn directly from the Lord is what the Bible tells us. Today, nearly uh, was half of the Jews living in Israel um, define themselves as secular, right? So they're Jewish because it's by blood. You know, they don't believe any of it or practice any of it. And less than 20% of them consider themselves orthodox or, you know, really care about it. But during the kingdom, Isaiah says, uh, there's, you're not just, they're not just going to believe in the Lord, but they're going to be taught directly by him. And he already told us about this earlier in the book, in Isaiah 2, chapter 2, verse 2. He says, now it will come about that in the last days the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains and, he, and will be raised above the hills and all the nations will stream to it. And many people will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he, it's capital H, that the Lord, right, that he may teach us concerning his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For the law will go forth from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Can you imagine? Like, your kids, you, you know, you don't send them up to Miss Ghana. You actually send them in a room where Jesus goes, let me tell you about this time I walked on water, you know. Uh, I can demonstrate or whatever, you know. They're, they're, they're going to learn directly from Jesus. And so he's going to be reigning and teaching in Jerusalem. Uh, and their kids, he says, are going to learn from him. They didn't. They didn't listen the first time he was in Jerusalem teaching. As a matter of fact, Jesus quotes this verse one time when they confront him about teaching. Uh, in John 6, verse 41, it says, The Jews were grumbling about him because he said, I am the bread that came down out of heaven. And they were saying, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down out of heaven? And Jesus answered and said to them, Do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. And then he says this. He says, It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught of God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. He says, basically, anyone who comes to me is learning from God. They are taught of God. This verse that all of you uh, Jewish folks that are questioning me right now, you all know this verse because everyone knew Isaiah. He says, that, that's what I'm doing. And they didn't receive him. They weren't ready for it. Um, they weren't ready for it then. Remember, John the Baptist started his ministry going around saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Right? They, if, if the nation would have trusted Jesus to, that he is who he says he is, the kingdom would have started, but that's, uh, they, they missed the boat on it. 
Uh, next time around, though, they'll get it. Isaiah 54, verse 14. It says, In righteousness you will be established. You will be far from oppression, uh, for you will not fear, and from terror, for it will not come near you. If anyone fiercely assails you, it will not be from me. Whoever assails you uh, will fall because of you. So, in the past, God has used uh, foreign oppressors to teach Israel lessons, right? Like with Babylon, that's what he was doing. They, wouldn't, they didn't want to listen to him. They wanted to worship false gods. And he says, okay, I'll, I'll let you go to a nation in captivity where that's the only thing you can do is worship false gods and see if it works out for you. Um, you know, he also used Assyria in the same way to, uh, to teach them lessons. That's much of what the Old Testament is, is God using physical realities to teach them spiritual truths. And so he says, there's, there's coming a day when you won't have to learn the hard way. Because if you're like me, that's about the only way I learn. Right? And some things I keep having to relearn the hard way. But there's coming a day when that's not how it'll be. Verse 16, he says, Behold, I myself have created the smith who blows the fire of coals and brings out a weapon for its work. And I have created the destroyer to ruin. So he says, you know, the blacksmiths that make the weapons, I made them. And the enemies that wield the weapons, I made them. I am in control of all of it. Verse 17, no weapon that is formed against you will prosper. And every tongue that accuses you in judgment, you will condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And their vindication is from me, declares the Lord. I love that verse, but so, so often we quote it the wrong way. And the reality is we still have trials, right? Weapons formed against us do work against us right now. Because Jesus told us, look, in this life you're going to have difficulties. But just know that I'm with you. And that in the end, I overcome. We overcome. So, I know this was a, uh, a tricky chapter. Next week, it gets a little bit easier. But for now, what can we get out of this? I think it's this. Even when it's barren, right? When, when you're dry, God says, just trust me. As a matter of fact, sing, right? Shout for joy. Sing to me. Uh, get your tent ready for what is coming. Because I promised you that the best is yet to come. And so when it's barren and when you're dry, don't think that this is how it will always be, right? You, there's coming a day, right? So... That you attempt great things for God and expect great things from God. And just wait and see. All right, let me pray for you. Lord, we thank you this evening that, um, that you are still changing hearts and lives. God, we thank you that your promises still hold true, that that there are better things ahead. Even when we're going through dark times and we're going through barren times, when we feel like there is no hope, Lord, we can look forward to that heavenly city. We can look forward to what it is you have in store for us. We know it's bigger and better than anything we can imagine, as your word says. So Lord, we just pray that you would, uh, you would help us bring that to mind, keep it in mind as we uh, go through this life, Lord, that we would keep our eye on the prize. That we would keep our mind uh, on heavenly things. Lord, we know that you are so much better and so much bigger than anything we face here. May we never lose sight of that. God, we pray for your blessing. We thank you for your mercy. And we pray you come and come quickly. In Jesus' name, amen. All right.
Ready? Break. Break.